What is up, y'all? Kevin Kuhn here from Athlete Factors. This is the Athlete Factors podcast. My guest today is Dr. Sam Buckner. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. How about you? Doing very well. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Uh, we tried doing this kind of right on the front end of, of the, uh, the whole shelter-in-place, quarantine, corona thing, and uh, right when everybody was excessively using the internet, um, we, we had some technical difficulties, but here we are, we're figuring it out. So this is, you know, this is go number two. It might be go number three, actually, which, you know, third time's a charm. So I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, um, before we jump into a little bit of your background, let's just kind of introduce the topic that, that we'll be covering today. So, um, What's periodization? What what is that? Because uh, that's a little bit of what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, that's that's a really good question, um, and it's it's a question I've been reading a lot about lately and thinking a lot about um, because when you explore the concept of periodization and you begin seeking out resources to find a definition, I, I think what you quickly find is inconsistency. Mm. Um, in what people define as, quote, periodization. Um, I'll, maybe I'll read the definition. The current textbook for the NSCA suggests that it's a theoretical and practical construct that allows for the systematic, sequential, and integrated programming of training interventions into mutually dependent periods of time in order to induce specific physiological adaptations that underpin performance outcomes. Hmm. I probably lost most people by the end of that. But, um, <laughs> I think you lost me. <laughs> so there's yeah. a lot there. <laughs> I think I lost myself. Um, <laughs> but in this definition, if I were to break it down, um, we have systematic, sequential, and integrative programming. It's, it's a little wordy, honestly, but I think what it's getting at is this idea that we create periods in sequence dedicated to specific training outcomes, right? So we might train hypertrophy for a given period of time before we train strength. The idea being that hypertrophy is going to give us some benefit when we begin training strength, mm. right? So it's a sequencing of our training into these different periods of time. Um, in order to induce specific physiological adaptations that underpin performance outcomes, so this definition is more so spe speaking to how we integrate our programming. Um, this definition, I think, leaves out the stress management concept, which I think is, if you look at the origins and roots of periodization, it was all about managing the stress of, you know, when it was developed, we developed periodization so we could integrate lifting weights with sport. Mm -hmm. And when we periodized, in a traditional model, we would decrease the volume over time, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason we're decreasing volume over time is because over time we're increasing time in sport. Mm -hmm. So this definition doesn't really include any of that stress management aspect, which I think is an important concept within periodization. Um, I'll read one more definition, and I think this is the more like what people perceive to be periodization. I don't think it necessarily is. Um, periodization refers to planned changes in acute training program variables of exercise order, exercise volume, number of sets, number of reps, exercise intensity, um, and so on, in an attempt to bring about continued and optimal fitness gains. Mm -hmm. And I think to the um, average consumer, and it, even, even the educated person with a degree in exercise science, in their mind, periodization is variation in exercise over time, whereas non-periodized is a lack of variation over time, mm -hmm. right? And if you look at the scientific studies that have been employed to study this concept, it would support this definition, which, you know, the studies we've used are an eight-week study where do you do the same thing on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or do you do something different on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? And that's kind of how periodization is actually depicted in study design. Um, hmm. 
So if I were to kind of give a summary of what I think the definition is, um, I don't think it's just variation. The variation is maybe what we use in our programming, but it's a training approach right, that considers all the stressors in an individual's life, right? So your work, your sport, whatever you have competing as, as a stress and designs periods of time dedicated to a specific outcome, but then assumes that those periods of time are going to influence each other, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the idea that there's potentiation from one phase of training to the next. Um, so yeah, I, I think the, the, the most perhaps simple way to explain periodization is stress management. Mm -hmm. So man managing the stress of lifting weights in my mind, is what periodization was intended to be. Mm -hmm. And what it has become is fancy programming, right? So mm -hmm. if you're advanced, you don't do the same thing. If you're advanced, you have variation. And I think that's what periodization has become to most people. Gotcha. Is, that clear? is that clear at all? I think so. I think that that kind of lays the, the framework or the groundwork, if you will, for kind of where the conversation is going to go because – um, yeah, like I didn't really learn about periodization at all in undergrad and I studied exercise science in grad school, um, you know, foundations of strength and conditioning where we were covering the NSCA textbook. Um, that's, that's where I first was exposed to it. And then while I'm in that class, I was also in another class with, um, with a collegiate strength coach and where we were learning about primarily linear periodization from the NSEA textbook, he was like, man, that's basic. I'm going to show you undulating periodization. Yeah. So then like I'm, I'm getting my mind, my mind is blown because I'm like, well, but, but w this says to do it this way. And, but there are other options. And then this says it this way. And then at the same time, I read a study comparing uh, a periodized weightlifting program with a non-periodized weightlifting program for, um, for non-athletic populations. And it shows eh, it's, it's a wash. You can do either one and the outcome's the same. So I, I was like, okay, I don't understand any of this at all. I thought, I thought this was just supposed to be pretty basic, like do things this way and you'll be successful. Don't do them this way. And there's increased risk of injury. There's decreased performance outcomes, yada, yada, yada. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of this whole conversation that we're about to have is what, what does this all mean? So, um, and really, is the house built on solid rock? Do we have a solid foundation here? Or is this house built on sand? And I think, uh, until fairly recently, people haven't been as uh, keen to look at that, uh, perhaps as they should have been. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, with that being said, tell us a little bit about your uh, your background, specifically uh, professional, academic, athletic, all of that. Yeah. Um, so I, I did my undergraduate. Um, at Temple University in Philadelphia in kinesiology. Um, got an internship as a strength and conditioning coach at Florida Atlantic University. Um, so I was a strength coach there for about a year and a half, worked with football, men's basketball, men's golf, and swimming. Um, and during my time there, the, the chair of the exercise science department walked in and somehow, I guess, convinced me to go get a master's degree. So I got a master's. <laughs> and exercise physiology um, from FAU. And um, during my first couple semesters, uh, during that master's degree, I was still working in strength and conditioning. Uh, but for, for me, it wasn't a great fit. I enjoyed working with athletes, it was fun. Um, but I'm a pretty quiet person and there was a lot of yelling and uh, just <laughs> big personalities and it, it, it didn't fit my personality so much. Um, so I, I think I was, kind of drawn to the science a little bit more mm -hmm. and uh i got my phd at the university of mississippi i worked with uh, dr jeremy lenicky and i'm currently an assistant professor at the university of south florida 
and director of the USF Muscle Lab. Um, and I've been there for two years now. Um, and yeah, that's, that's my story. My only athletic achievement that I think is worth mentioning is I held the world record for most consecutive 90 degree pushups in 2012. So that was like <laughs> when I was beginning my PhD and nice. it's just been broken, but I'm going to make a comeback and get that world record again. <laughs> um, well, that's, there's something to that, man. You know, that's, that's not nothing. So I yeah, go for it. Go for it. I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to try one more time before I get too old to actually pull it <laughs> off. <laughs> That's awesome. Excellent. So, uh, so a, a lot of, a lot of this came up, um, uh, not while I was recording with, uh, Jeremy Lineke, but, but afterwards just asking him, you know, other, other really interesting uh, topics to cover that he would recommend or interesting people to have on. And so he mentioned that you would be able to have an excellent conversation about periodization just because maybe what we thought we knew isn't exactly what uh, science is actually uh, showing us now. So um, so we, we've mentioned a little bit about periodization, so I guess we can kind of dive into it a little bit deeper. Um, but a lot of, a lot of this stuff you covered in, in a research paper that was, uh, recently published. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Just so, um, if people are interested, they can look it up and read it and get in, into some of these questions a little deeper. Yeah. So, um, it's. The basics of training for muscle size and strength, we uh, kind of wanted to just bring together the evidence for training for muscle size and training for muscle strength. And, you know, even when I entered my PhD, my assumption was the best way to train is, okay, we got to employ periodization if we want to maximize muscle growth. Mm -hmm. We have to employ periodization if we want to maximize muscle strength. Um, it's just, it's what I had learned. It's what I've been taught. And everyone who was big and strong seemed to utilize some form of periodization. So there wasn't a good reason to question it, you know, at, at the time or I hadn't thought to. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I like to tell the story. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll tell you a story of how we questioned it. Um, because I, I think sometimes it gets, gets misunderstood is it's just something we wanted to come after, you know, this idea of periodization. <laughs> um, but it, it was, you know, us in the lab at, at Ole Miss designing a training study. And, you know, in our research, our goal was to have muscle growth. So over an eight week period, we want to have as much growth as, as we can achieve so we can measure it with beam and ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're designing a study and, um, my lab mate, Brian Barnett, he raised his hand and he said, why are we just using progressive overload? Why aren't we using periodization? Right. Because we've been taking the strength and conditioning class that says that's the best way, the most optimal way. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, Jeremy Lenicky, he said, that's a great point. Find me the paper that shows that's true. And that's what we'll do. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, Brian, we call him <laughs> we call him Butters. He, he went looking for these papers and he couldn't find the evidence. So then, you know, we are all tasked to go find these papers. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we, we were coming up short. There wasn't, there didn't seem to be good experimental evidence that periodization, you know, and keep in mind, most training studies are eight weeks to 12 weeks long, mm -hmm. um, that em employing periodization is going to maximize increases in muscle size over time, but then employing periodization is going to maximize your strength over time. Um, and then kind of along those lines, you know, we were writing that paper, um, and right before we submitted it, uh, my friend and colleague, Matthew Jesse, Dr. Matthew Jesse, he, um, pulled, he, he pulled up Hans Selye's original paper for the general adaptation syndrome. Mm -hmm. And if you read on periodization, what you'll find is that the theoretical framework in which it's based upon is Hans Selye's general adaptation syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, and he pulled up that paper and, and we were seeing that it's, it's basically dosing rats with toxic doses of drugs adrenaline, atropine, morphine, and, and, and watching their stress response. Um, 
And that's where we get the stress curve that you see in textbooks to depict the general adaptation syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, so basically this paper that's published in MSSC, uh, Medicine, Science and Sports and Exercise, it, it kind of visits all this literature. You know, do we need periodization to maximize muscle size and strength? And does a theoretical framework make sense to support the claims that are made? Um, and we also talk about overtraining. Is periodization necessary to avoid overtraining? Um, and we talk about, um, I think, a little bit about the strength potential. So one of the kind of ideas within periodization is that you have hypertrophy before strength because that's going to kind of help you have a greater strength potential during that strength phase. Mm -hmm. um, all, all those sorts of ideas. But I think even more so, we just... We dive into the evidence itself that's cited, right? So if you cite a study, not you, but you know the field, mm -hmm. if they cite a study that periodization is better than non-periodized, we find that study and we look at their study design, we look at their findings and discuss that as, okay, is this evidence, is, mm -hmm. is there good evidence that periodized techniques are superior to non-periodized? Um, and the spoiler is we didn't find that that evidence existed or there's not good evidence. <gasps> uh, yeah. But that's what <laughs> I was told in all my classes, man. Like this, what are you talking about? This doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that's what most people are still taught in, in most classes. Yes. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, it didn't seem to be the case. Um, like part and, of the uh, reason that I think I'm a better coach or a better kinesiologist or a better personal trainer or whatever is because I think I know how to program because yeah. I was told this will make you better. This will make you a better coach if you know how to do this. And so it's hard for me to then well, look, at, look at somebody who's just doing – quote unquote, willy nilly coaching, just ah, throwing this in and like, <sighs> obviously the results will speak for themselves. So I still think I'm, I'm halfway decent, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's just like, it's, it's hard to, to wrap your mind around that because it's something that we've been told this is a fact. And yeah. now we don't, we don't necessarily have the evidence to say, yeah, it is a fact. It's and, a scary and thing. Just yeah, and, but and just to be clear, if, if using periodization might be the best way to approach it, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's that's not something we've said. We've never said you know periodization is not the best way. Mm -hmm. We said it's one way of, of probably many. Mm -hmm. And I, um, you said uh, this. I'll pick at this because I think it's a good talking point. You said you know how to program, right? Um, one problem in the literature right now is a lot of people say programming is not periodization mm. and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is, I think this is maybe a good topic to, to discuss. So in our review of the literature, we would find a study that cited in a statement that uh, periodization leads to greater increases in muscle size and strength than a non-periodized program. One example would be the Stone paper from 1981 um, in the Journal of Sports Medicine. Uh, and that study is a six-week study where there's wow. a, quote, period, periodization group. The periodization group for weeks one through three, they do five by ten, five sets of ten. Weeks four, they do five sets of five. Week five, they do three sets of three. And week six, they do three sets of two. Mm -hmm. The non-periodized group for all six weeks does three sets of six, right? Mm. So one group does the same thing for six weeks. The other is, is basically gradually increasing the intensity or increasing the load mm -hmm. and decreasing the volume over a six week period, right? So when we use studies like this, so we looked at this study and we said, we don't think this is good evidence, right? For one, it's a six week study, mm -hmm. which you can see changes in, a six, in six weeks. But when you read this study, um, both groups lost lean mass over time in mm -hmm. response to lifting weights. So we're like, that shouldn't be the typical response. How does that happen? Maybe this isn't <laughs> strong evidence, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was our kind of critique of this and many similar studies. 
um, what we received back is, well, that's not periodization. That's just programming, right? Mm. So we, we used the evidence that's cited and discussed it, saying this probably isn't great evidence that it's better. And the response was, well, that's programming, not periodization. And I actually, I agree with that criticism. I agree that this is programming, but in our critique of the periodization literature, what we critiqued were the studies cited for periodization, uh-huh. right? Yeah. But if I if I could explain, <laughs> um, you know, the, the so periodization was developed from Hans Selye's general adaptation syndrome, right? And I might be jumping ahead. Can I explain it? Because I, I think yeah, it might, go ahead. For sure. It might lead into everything I think you need to actually study periodization. Uh-huh. Um, so if, if your listeners care for just a little bit of background, um, Hans Selye was a, a researcher in the area of, of, of medicine and drug interactions. Um, and he was doing rodent research looking at um, how rodents responded to extreme stress. Right. So what he'd do is he would he would dose these rodents with a toxic dose of various drugs. It could be atropine, morphine, um, adrenaline. So you'd inject them with what he called a lethal dose. Now, a lethal dose is a dose that would kill the rodent, right? But before it would kill the rodent, he would note this response, right? And that response was what he called the general adaptation syndrome. So it was the general response to any toxic stressor, um, that he that he noted in his experiments and the the what the general response was was he gave you a toxic dose of adrenaline right and not you the, the rodent of course and he would see that the he would dissect the um, animal and he would see thymus involution so the thymus would shrink mm-hmm. right probably indicative of immune function um, the uh, the adrenal gland would hyperplasia so it get it get much larger and swollen and it didn't matter what toxic stressor he gave. Right, it could be any drug. It caused the same general response, hence hmm. the general adaptation syndrome. Mm-hmm. And it, it was basically he interpreted it as your body's ability to adapt to stress, right? Um, and then, so the alarm phase was when he would give you this toxic dose, and he would know this tissue deformation, right? The thymus involution, the adrenal hyperplasia. That was alarm. Mm-hmm. Well, in the sports exercise literature. We say the alarm phase is the first phase of the general adaptation syndrome in response to exercise. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not thymus involution. It's not adrenal hyperplasia. It's not us resisting death. It's muscle soreness. Mm. It's fatigue, right? Mm-hmm. So what he found in his experiments is if he kept dosing this drug, right, the rodent would enter what he called the resistance phase, right? So this drug that should kill them They were able to withstand the stress for a small period of time, right? And during this period of time that he called resistance, the tissues sometimes, not all the time, would return to the normal size, right? So the thymus would appear normal despite being exposed to this very toxic stress. Mm -hmm. Um, However, over time, if you continued giving that stress, right, eventually the rodent would reach exhaustion or in his model, exhaustion was always noted by death of the organism, mm-hmm. right? So you reach exhaustion, that was death. Um, so those are the experiments for the general adaptation syndrome. And, you know, they, they, we've been quick to draw parallels, right? Um, so we have the alarm phase, which I says muscle damage, it's muscle soreness, perhaps. Something that we adapt to fairly quickly and we recover from. In the sports science literature, resistance, right? is where we say, okay, this is the period of time where you're growing your muscles, you're getting stronger, you're adapting, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in Selye's model, it was simply where this stress wasn't killing you yet and your organs were returning to their normal size, right? Mm-hmm. So we didn't see all these manifestations of this toxic stress. And then over time in Selye's model, you couldn't resist anymore. You actually, in, what he said is you'd run out of adaptation energy, and I'll talk about that in a second. In the sports science literature, when you reach the exhaustion phase, what we call it is overtraining, right? Mm-hmm. So when stress has not been managed properly, what we say is you'll overtrain, right? And 
what's suggested is that you need to employ periodization in order to avoid overtraining or exhaustion, right? Hmm. So remarkably different than the consequence being what they were in Selye's experiments. Um, Han Selye did use exercise in his studies, mm-hmm. but it was a toxic dose of exercise in a rodent model. Hmm. And if you read the stress literature, an involuntary exercise stimulus in rodents is much different than a voluntary exercise stimulus in humans. Yeah. Because, I mean, you go to any conference and exercise is medicine, right? It's, it's, it's looked at as a very good thing. Mm-hmm. If you look at Selye's model, you would say exercise is a, a toxic stress. It, it's, it's, it's dangerous. Mm-hmm. And if it were, in fact, the stress noted by Selye, we would recommend exercise to nobody. <laughs> right, because the consequence, if you didn't periodize correctly, would be um, very problematic. Um, so, if you understand the general adaptation syndrome, right, even though I think it's been misapplied because I think these are two very different things, mm-hmm. but it, it helps you realize that okay, periodization is supposed to be a stress management strategy, right. And I think it's loosely related to Han Selye's concept of adaptation energy. So what Han Selye said was, you can only adapt to so much stress, right? So this is how he explained why his rodents died. The way he viewed adaptation is you have a certain amount of adaptation energy. You're born with it, right? And the analogy I've used, I don't know if it's perfect, but the one I've used is it's like a fuel tank, right? And you use up this fuel tank, and every time you use it, you're adapting to something. And in Selye's mind, the way he viewed adaptation is, once you used it up, you can no longer adapt and you die, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know if any of the theories of aging follow this, this type of logic. They, they might. There, there might be some logic here. But basically, that's how he viewed adaptation. Anytime you adapted to something, you used up some energy, and you brought yourself closer to death. Right. Um, so that's kind of where the stress management came in. Um, so basically, Han Selye, he published his experiments. They're kind of popularized and adapted by different fields. And in strength and conditioning, we took his curves with alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. And we fitted them to something that, okay, alarm, you get sore, right? You don't feel good when you exercise the first time. Mm-hmm. Uh, resistance, okay. You're able to withstand the stress. We'll call that adaptation. You're growing. You're getting stronger. And we replace death with overtraining, right? Um, <laughs> and, and that's how I see it. And we, we also trace these things back to their origins in the physiology literature or in the strength and conditioning literature. Mm-hmm. It happened in the Journal of Track Technique, mm-hmm. right? So John, John Garhammer in the Journal of Track Technique, I, I believe this is in the 70s. Um, he says, GAS is a three-phase response pattern exhibited by all organisms exposed to stressors and explains the different phases. But then he says that a single bout of exercise, for example, may include all three phases. Um, at the onset of activity, one may feel uncomfortable or tight. This can be interpreted as the alarm stage of the general adaptation syndrome. Hmm. But as one becomes accustomed to the activity stressor, as it persists and the body makes the required adjustments, it adapts to the stimulus. Finally, if the physical activity is prolonged, one may become fatigued or exhausted with performance deteriorating. So I think this, this has to be one of the first instances where it popped up in relation to sport. Mm-hmm. But John, John Garhammer was talking about within, this is 1979, within a single training bout, he said you experience all three of these things. Mm-hmm. Right. But even in Salier's model with rodents, it would sometimes take 30 days and 30 days in a rodent's life would be a much longer period of time in a human's life. Yeah. Um, but these things he were, he was documenting, you know, you feel tired at the end of your workout. That's not the exhaustion phase of the general adaptation syndrome. Mm-hmm. Right. But it was acknowledging parallels between what Salier saw and what he noted with exercise. Mm-hmm. And Fred Wolt did something similar also in the journal track technique, 
Um, his article was published in 1960. Um, and, and he basically says the same thing. Um, but he, he looks at it a little bit more long term. Um, he says, any stress draws from the body's finite quantity of adaptation energy. Those stressors for which the body is less well adapted will make the greatest demand on the body's um, store of adaptation energy and most apt to hasten the exhaustion reactions. So uh, again, he was, he was drawing parallels to humans and saying that we need to consider his research in resistance training. Hmm. And then the theoretical um, model of strength training was published by Mike Stone um, and I think 1981, somewhere around there, um, Jay Garham was actually a co-author where they basically suggested the adaptation, the adoption of the general adaptation syndrome as a theoretical framework to explain adaptation to resistance training, hmm. right? So basically mirroring these, you know, Hans Selye's curve, but replacing it with these different ideas. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you think that the idea was everyone is familiar with Cellier's general adaptation syndrome? So if we use it as a metaphor, then people will understand this is how it's similar, but this is how it's different. Or do you think the idea was, ah, that's, a, that's the exact same thing except for you know, we're not exercising till we die, but everything else is, it's, it's, it's a perfect uh, mirror image. Do you think, or it was a kind of a hybrid, or, or do you think some people were taking it one way versus the other, or? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, when you read these papers, it seems like it's just uh, adapting the concept to explain adaptation, mm -hmm. right? Um, and yeah, I think it was just using the wrong thing to explain why we adapt, mm -hmm. right? Because what came out of the general adaptation syndrome was a supercompensation hypothesis, mm -hmm. right? Where we deplete things, and then we supercompensate. Yep. Um, and I think it was just all incorrect, you know? I, I, that's the rationale for overreaching, right? Like for, yeah. for a lot of uh, periodization models the idea is you, you want to train till you're till you're almost overtrained, but then you remove the stress and then there's that super compensation and and exactly. if you don't then there's the maladaptation and that's overtraining and that's yeah bad and, and we employ periodization to achieve this so you're training you have the alarm phase for performance goes like this right and then you enter resistance you're actually adapting you're going you're getting stronger and if we don't periodize we're and we're, we're at risk of this plummeting back down. Mm -hmm. What we want to achieve is, is supercompensation, which is going up. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the supercompensation hypothesis would suggest that you would have to deplete something to improve something, right? Mm -hmm. um, if, if that were how we adapted, we'd have to get weaker to get stronger, right? Um, which I don't think is the case. And sure, we get temporarily weaker via fatigue, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's actually us being weaker. It's us not being able to express our strength at a given moment. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's different than a supercompensation. Um, supercompensation for muscle growth, right? I, um, I didn't print out that paper for today, but there was a paper that suggested that they saw supercompensation for muscle size and that it, it looked like muscle size had decreased post-training and increased a few weeks later. Hmm. Um, I can't remember the authors on that paper, but supercompensation hypothesis would suggest you'd have to deplete muscle size to increase muscle size. If we're following these, these models, which I, I don't think explain how we adapt. Um, was that so, yeah. paper, was that paper cited in, in your paper? Cause I think I remember reading something about that. Like, it, it happened like 30 days later, all of a sudden there's this increase in muscle size. It was something crazy like that. Yeah, yeah. We cited it in the paper. And, um, you know, what, what you see is there's a discrepancy between their muscle fiber, cross-sectional area, and their muscle imaging. So 
Hmm. Their muscle imaging follows a typical trend where there's no decrease in muscle size and it increases like you would expect, but their fiber data tells a different story. So why hmm. they saw that, I don't know. Mm -hmm. right? but, but some people have found that and said, okay, we have the first evidence of supercompensation for muscle growth, which is cool. I mean, it, that might be how we adapt. I don't think it is. But if it is, you know, I guess the, the question comes up, why would we decrease our muscle size to increase our muscle size? You know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that seems counterintuitive. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't seem like it's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it seems wasteful, right? Yeah. Um, but if I could bring this back, I guess, to where I started, which was the stone paper in 1981 to explain why I don't think this is periodization. Right? A six-week study, one group has variation, and the other group doesn't. Mm -hmm. Right, So periodization was developed to manage the stress associated with exercise, right? to avoid overtraining, to avoid exhaustion. Right? So that would have to suggest that something about the non-periodized group doing a three-by-six for six weeks would lead to exhaustion, mm -hmm. which I, I don't think it would. And I, I don't think they were training to failure in this paper. Not that I think training to failure would lead them to exhaustion right, or overtraining, but six weeks of a three by six, I don't think is going to do that, mm -hmm. right? When you consider their protocol, it's not competing with sport, mm -hmm. right? So in some studies, or if, if, if you take periodization, what I think it's intended to do, it's intended to manage what you're doing in the weight room with what else is going on. Mm -hmm. So the quote periodization group, if they're decreasing volume over time because they were running a lot more sprints at week six than at week, weeks one through three, then I'd say, okay, that, that might be periodization because they're balancing the stress of lifting weights with the stress of their sport. Mm -hmm. But when I read this paper, I look at the three by six group, right? Three sets of six reps I don't think they're maximizing muscle size with that protocol. Right? It doesn't seem like it's ideal for hypertrophy. And it's probably not the best to maximize strength either. Mm -hmm. right? So they're training at like a suboptimal training program for both muscle size and strength mm -hmm. for six weeks. So you could train intentionally for growth. Just do three or four sets to failure with, I don't know, low load, high load, moderate load. Mm -hmm. And that'll lead to what I think is a maximal growth response. Or just train heavy for six weeks, and then I think that'll lead to a maximal strength response. Mm -hmm. So I think the non-periodized group sets you up to be mediocre at everything, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> whereas, whereas a periodization group starts off with three weeks, five by ten. So that might be a hypertrophic stimulus. That might be a muscle growth stimulus, I would think. Mm -hmm. um, followed by five by five. So that's like a, a strength stimulus, but not the best strength stimulus probably. And then weeks five and six, three by three and three by two. So they move into something that's going to be better for maximal strength. Yep. And they test better in strength, right? So people who have been taught periodization would say the reason the periodized group is better is because they have variation. So the mechanism is thought to be variation, right? There's no magical mechanism here. The specificity, the fact that the periodized group is lifting heavier close to the strength assessment is the reason they're stronger. Yeah. Right? It's the most similar to what they're testing at yeah. pre and post. So yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. They're testing them on a one RM and they're doing two reps for that last week. So they're practicing closer to that skill. They're yeah. a little bit better in strength. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the three by six, if they tested their strength at a six RM, the non periodized group is probably going to be better. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um so yeah I, I think studies like this i don't think they're periodization because there's no competing stressor typically right mm -hmm. so there's no reason to suspect overtraining or overreaching or any of these things so then you have to just you need to say or, or ask the question what type of programming would best help me achieve what i'm interested in and typically what the, most people i talk to they're interested in muscle size and strength Right. So if you're interested in muscle size, I would program differently than both of these. Right. And do you need variation to maximize muscle size? I don't think there's good evidence that you do. 
Hmm. You might you might psychologically benefit from variation. Like some mm -hmm. people don't like doing the same thing over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to just get the strongest you can, I, I'd say you have to lift heavy. And maybe you want to employ some type of periodization just because you don't want to lift heavy all of the time, right? But is the variation the reason you get stronger? I do not think so. Hmm. Um, so, so yeah. This is... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, you take it away. I, I'm probably going to ramble. <laughs> That's why you're here. Um, yeah. uh, what I find interesting is I'm, I'm trying to look through the lens of what's going to make my athletes better, right? Like, like I have clients who all they care about is aesthetics. And so it's just, how do we change body composition? So how can I get bigger? How can I get stronger? How can I reduce fat mass? How can I weigh less or how can I weigh more? Whatever the case may be, I've got some of those clients, but the majority of my clients are athletes. And so for me, the goal is to increase strength. But if I am focusing on uh, modalities or, or training mechanisms that focus solely on increasing strength, then that will have negative outcomes for all of these other athletic variables, like endurance, like mobility, perhaps, like sports-specific movements. So for me, this is where things get really interesting because the whole idea of periodization like you said, is so that you can balance out these potentially injury reducing benefits of strength training with their sports specific training, right? Like if you want to be a really good runner, you have to run, yeah. but the more running you do, potentially the more injury risk you accrue. So that's where strength training, strength and conditioning, sports specific strength and conditioning can come into play. So, um, yeah, like this is, it, it sounds to me like what you're saying is we don't really have any actual research on periodization. All we have is research on programming. Yeah. And the majority of that is because we don't have any research on periodization, most of the research that we're looking at is with strength training only and not strength training in conjunction with some other sport. Exactly. Wow. Um, Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it, is, <laughs> it is shocking, right? Because, yeah. I mean, when you think of the evidence-based approach, I, I, periodization is, is the word everyone comes up with like yep. or if, if you want to impress somebody you know at la fitness you're like have you heard of periodization mm -hmm. you know yep. um but <laughs> al along those lines with sport so there's a paper i think it was 2004 um kramer et al and they studied um they looked at serve velocity so um, a tennis thing um, but basically, they em employed a periodized resistance training program or a non-periodized resistance training program. It was a nine-month study. So this study set up an, or actu an actual scenario where we could study periodization, right? Um, and what they did in this nine-month study is they had one group. And I think at the beginning of the study, they were lifting weights three times per week. So the non-periodized group, they did the same thing Monday, Wednesday. Friday, right? The periodized group did something different Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, right? Um, once they entered season and had more competitions, both groups would train one day less on weeks where they had competitions, right? And they were volume matched. So this study, which could have studied periodization, I think missed the mark. And let me explain why. I think changing what you do on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday isn't the stress management of periodization, right? They're volume matched. Mm. And when they got into season, they, or when they had competitions, they would do one less um, resistance training day. 
that to me is the periodization part mm -hmm. on a week where you have a match you train less in the gym mm -hmm. right so when i read that study you know they're, they're both basically are doing the same thing the entire time there's no hypertrophy phase followed by strength phase followed by power phase it's this different Monday, Wednesday, Friday programming or the same Monday, Wednesday, Friday programming with both changing the volume to adjust for tournaments, right? So when I read that paper, I was like, oh, this is going to be, you know, some evidence here. But I don't think they actually studied periodization because what periodization would do was you need one group just doing the same thing, right? Not accounting for the stress of tennis mm -hmm. and another group accounting for the stress of tennis while employing periods of time to specific outcomes that are meant to build upon one another and show that that's better than the other strategy or technique. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, when I read that study, it just seemed to me that they both handled the stress of tennis the same way. So either neither is periodization or they're both periodization. So even mm -hmm. though one does, I think you can do the same reps and as long as you account for the other stress, it's still periodization. Yeah. So um, that paper, I, I, I think you can consider they periodize the same, but they programmed differently, if that hmm. makes sense. Yeah. So that might be the only one that's yeah. actually looking at what it says it's looking at. Yeah, to, to some part. extent, but, but yeah. I still don't think it doesn't follow most of the definitions we have of periodization because it doesn't have periods of time. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't implement the phase potentiation um, and, and those, those sorts of things. So maybe very loosely, depending on which definition you pick. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. So that's, that just reminded me of another thing that you started to mention where um, like th this was how I was taught. This is how you program, uh, you know, micro cycles or meso cycles but then the periodization is, is the whole thing, the macro cycle. So, um, so yeah, you've got to focus first on hypertrophy and then from there you move to strength and then from there you move to power. So uh, is, is any of that grounded in, in data or is that just assumptions or is that from, uh, anecdotal evidence like wh where did that idea come from because that's that's how i was taught this is how you have to do it yeah it's like i said it's it's how i was taught as well um and so when i when i teach my strength and conditioning class um what i always say is you know the studies that claim to study periodization i, I don't think of periodization right mm -hmm. because over eight weeks I can think of better ways to grow muscle than a lot of these periodized programs. Mm -hmm. um, or if I want to maximize strength, you know, the, the DUP the, is the hypertrophy day doing anything for strength over that eight weeks. You know, you could take it out. And I think strength would be the same train mm -hmm. twice a week instead of having that strength day in the middle or the hypertrophy day in the middle. Um, so those things, I don't think of periodization, but when I am, I'm, I'm talking to the students and I'm, you know, helping them get ready for careers in strength and conditioning, you know, you're working with athletes. Organization is a very helpful tool. I, mm -hmm. I think you would agree. Right? Mm -hmm. Mapping things out. And yeah, maybe you want to design a block and focus on hypertrophy, right? And, you know, this is a topic for another day, how much change, increasing muscle size, how much of an influence that has for muscle strength. Um, you know, I, I think some people are going to think it's very important. And if you think it's very important, at some point, you're going to have to train for growth, right? Mm -hmm. um, but is, is that period of growth what enhances a subsequent period of strength? I'm less convinced. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if you're working with athletes and, you know, they're less experienced in lifting weights, I think there's, there just needs to be some gradual progression and maybe some of those linear models are, are just helpful in progressing them along and getting them where you want them to be as far as your strength and their power and, and building a foundation. So I can get on board with a lot of these concepts. And like, if as a skeleton, you, you 
kind of stick to a, a somewhat of a linear model, right? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, but is there good evidence that you get this potentiation from one phase to the next? I don't think so, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I've, I've gone over the, the resistance training literature that, you know, lifting weights, its influence on sports performance um, is pretty small. I'm not saying it's not meaningful, but it's small, right? Yeah. So ca capturing a difference in sports performance um, from a block of hypertrophy that was performed, you know, really on, early on in the season is, is going to probably be really difficult to show that that was, you know, contributing to their performance. Yeah. Um, and, and no, I, I don't think that evidence exists or I'm not aware of that evidence. Yeah. Um, so the, the whole phase potentiation aspect, I can appreciate it. And I think if it's the way you want to organize your, your, your training programs, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I suppose my problem or, or the, the issue I take is when someone says, well, you need to use this. This is the most optimal way, mm -hmm. right? When people say that they're talking about the eight week, you know, DUP versus some other type of periodization, right? That's what mm -hmm. people are talking about. They're not talking about this organizational strategy, right? To manage stress in the athlete's life. Right. Because over time, and you know, you work with a lot of athletes, over time, you're naturally going to want to decrease volume because sport is more important. And, you know, once, once they're in season and approaching season, sport is their priority. Yep. Right. And, you know, if you're you know, doing like, things right, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, at that point, how important is it to maintain their one RM strength or, or come out of season and still have a really high one RM, you know, again, it's not the priority. The hope right. was, you know, you helped build up their strength in the off season. The hope is that has some transfer to their sport during the season. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot of it is, is there's not good evidence. I, I would say, you know, periodization, but I guess if we zoom out even farther, you know, the, the benefits that strength training has on sports performance are also not fully realized because we don't have great study design at that level either. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, right? We have a lot of theory and we have a lot of reasons as to why we believe these things can influence and, and make athletes better, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think I get perceived as anti periodization not at all. You know, I, <laughs> if, if I went back to being a strength coach, I'm probably going to employ some form of periodization. Mm -hmm. Right. And I kind of like a linear model just because, you know, you lay out the times. Okay. When are they going to be spending more time in their sport? Okay. That's when I got to make sure they're doing less volume with me. Mm -hmm. um, and then whether you use some type of undulating model where you include hypertrophy all along the way because you don't want to sacrifice it towards the tail end. Um, I think that's all going to be, um, you know, the coach's preference because I don't think there's going to be a large difference between a lot of those programming strategies. When you look at the outcome that we actually care about, which is sports performance. Um, I think the crowd that we sometimes end up talking to, uh, probably both of us, is a non-athlete, right? Or mm -hmm. non-athlete's not fair. Physique athlete or strength athlete, yeah. right? Yep. For for a physique athlete, your resistance training is your primary stress. So you're mm -hmm. not periodizing against football. Lifting weights is your sport. Mm -hmm. So it almost removes periodization. And it becomes programming because there's there's not that competing stressor. Mm -hmm. Right. So then it's how do I best program to maximize muscle growth? Mm -hmm. And if you're a strength athlete, right, you're no longer you're not programming again against football, basketball, soccer. Right? Right. So you're not decreasing volume to account for those things. Um, if you decrease volume, it's because either you aren't recovering, you need to reduce volume or you did a couple blocks of hypertrophy under the assumption that that's going to make you stronger during your strength blocks. Mm -hmm. Right. The periodization outside the context of sport, I think, is something entirely different. 
but we assume it's the same thing. When mm -hmm. we talk about it, you know, most of the literature you read, the studies, the six and eight week studies that claim to study periodization are more geared towards the strength athlete or the physique athlete because it's lifting weights and looking at muscle size and muscle strength. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Um, and at that point, I think it is just which eight week programming strategy is the best way to maximize muscle size? Which programming strategy is the best way to maximize strength? And yeah. through that lens, it's, it helps you, I think, frame what you're actually trying to discuss. Yeah, I think a lot of people just want to assume whatever's, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Like if, if it'll make me stronger or it'll make me bigger, that's going to be really good for sport. But um, like you mentioned before, I'm not, I'm not convinced that it has that much of a performance benefit. I mean, if you go from weighing 120 pounds to weighing 220 pounds and you're a football player, that size and strength is going to have a huge benefit as long as you got that weight from, from lifting weights. Yeah. But, but trying to take a high school cross country athlete who weighs a buck 40 and trying to take him through a hypertrophy phase when uh, he's probably not eating enough calories to hit maintenance level already. Mm -hmm. He's definitely not getting enough protein. Taking him through a hypertrophy phase and then taking him through a strength phase and then taking him through a power phase throughout the course of his season, I'm not convinced that that's going to do him any good. Compared to, obviously I'm a little biased because this is what I do, but I think what's, what's better is evaluate his weaknesses. Yeah, do some general strength and conditioning just to make his body more resilient. But really, I'm focused on where is he weak? Fix that as much as I can so that while he's running, he doesn't have some excessive knee valgus and, and arch collapse and uh, ankle rolls in and hips shift out. And then he's losing all of, all of the force that he's generating into the ground. And it's not propelling him as far forward as it should every step. That's, that's what I'm focused on. So yeah. our that's where I'm like, okay, there's the, the stuff that I do. I don't really have anywhere that I can look as a model to periodize for that, which yeah. can be really frustrating sometimes, but yeah. you know, as, as a kinesiologist and strength coach, I think it's really important to be a scientist. Like my mentor he takes that very seriously. A lot of the people that I've work, worked with, they take that very seriously. You know what? The data doesn't exist. So I'm going to do as much as I can to try to create the experiment and follow the scientific method and see what happens and, and do yeah. as much as I can with what I have. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. You, know, you admit that the data doesn't exist, right? But the strength coach that's doing linear periodization and has that hypertrophy block and assumes that's increasing their athlete's performance. Does that data exist? You know, I, I would, <laughs> you know, it probably doesn't. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Or some associations, there's some probably some cross-sectional data supporting the concept. Right. But I would say, you know, your approach is just as evidence-based as these other approaches, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the, the traditional approach or the train for muscle size, train for muscle strength, you know, it's, it's in a lot of ways it is outdated because, you know, if, if I, one thing I learned in undergrad, and I certainly don't believe this anymore, is that strength can't possibly be a bad thing, right? Muscle size, that couldn't possibly be a bad thing either. Mm -hmm. So if your athletes are bigger and stronger, they're better athletes, mm -hmm. right? And that's not sound logic, right? Because muscle size is not always going to be a good thing for an athlete. Mm -hmm. And muscle strength isn't always going to lead to a 
performance enhancement in the sport, right? So I think a lot of people need to to rewind that and listen to that again because this is a conversation that I have to have with athletes all the time. Strength is one athletic variable, but it's viewed too often as the only athletic variable because the whole idea is if you get strong, that's going to fix everything. But there's a whole lot more involved in athletics besides strength, like the ability to accelerate, decelerate, change direction. Um, it's, it's not just strength. There's agility, there's mobility, there's flexibility. There, there's all these things. Endurance, there's cardiovascular endurance. There's, um, there's, there's so much going on. So I think what you just said there is extremely important. People need to understand like, yeah, being, being strong is a very good thing, but it's not, uh, the strongest person on the field is rarely the most athletic. Yeah. So you can be as strong as an ox. That doesn't mean it's going to make you a better athlete. There are times and instances where it will improve your performance. But when it comes to team sports, just being bigger and stronger doesn't, uh, that's a band aid. It's not necessarily a, a cure. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, we, um, we have a paper uh, that explores kind of changes in strength and how they cross over, right? So, um, a lot of what we do in sport is based on something called the generality of strength. So what the generality of strength is, is it's the suggestion that, um, okay, if, if my bicep is stronger, right, the generality of strength would say, if I'm in the top 10%, most strength tasks that involve the bicep, I'm going to be in the top 10%, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that muscle group for me, in general, I'm going to be stronger than other people in tasks that measure the strength of my bicep. But what we, what we actually care about in strength and conditioning is not the generality of strength, it's a generality of strength adaptation, right? Mm. So if I make my bicep 10% stronger on a unilateral bicep curl with a dumbbell, how much transfer do I get to other tasks that use that same muscle group, right? Mm. So you know, uh, on a bicep dumbbell curl, maybe I get 10% improvement, but maybe only 3% of that improvement is seen in another task that uses my bicep, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. if I do an isometric pull, it doesn't show the same change. If I do an isokinetic muscle action, another strength measure, it's not the same. And the same thing could be for, um, let's say the quads, right? If you make your quads stronger, the general of strength would say, if you're in the top 1%, maybe your knee extension strength is, is in the highest in the group, your squat strength, right? And we can pick other exercises that involve those muscle groups and you'll, you'll place in the top tier. But if you do 10 weeks of knee extension, extension and make your quads stronger, maybe only 10% of that strength is going to show in the squat hmm. or, or in an exercise that's not the knee extension. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so what we what what you find when you look at the resistance training literature is that the farther removed you get from the strength task you trained the less transfer you get right mm -hmm. so from a from a squat to a knee extension you already lose a lot right mm -hmm. so imagine how much you lose by the time you get to the field or we're actually doing sports performance mm -hmm. right so you, yeah. you might increase your 1RM a ton and you think that's great. Well, that 50% increase in your 1RM on a squat doesn't mean a 50% increase on the field in your sport. Right. Maybe, maybe it's a 2 or 3% two or increase. We don't really know. We don't have good enough data, I don't think. Right. Right? Yeah. But the transfer, you lose. as The farther away you get from that squat, you lose, lose, lose. And there might be a point where you can't even measure that improvement, although you still believe it's there, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of written a little bit, or me and my, my uh, colleagues have written a little bit on 
you know, how much that strength relies in the gym has meaning in the context of sport. And I, I think we exaggerate it. Mm -hmm. um, I think we exaggerate it quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a hard pill to swallow for a lot of strength coaches. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's the whole idea is kind of a double edged sword because, uh, especially for collegiate strength coaches, if the team does really well, then the strength coach is the last person to get uh, any sort of credit. And if the team does really poorly, then the strength coach is the first person to get blamed. So it's tough when like your whole job is, is, you know, like you've got to increase their athleticism. You've got to increase their, their speed, their power, their strength, all of these variables. And then we're told, Hey, here's how you do it. But actually in reality, what you're doing may not actually have as much, uh, of a beneficial athletic outcome as we think. So, um, yeah. That's one uh, one reason I think uh, Dr. I think it's Michael Yesis, Yesis. Um, he's developed kind of a, a different model for at least for team sports. Um, I think it's called one by 20 where he doesn't have any of his team athletes do anything remotely close to one RM, two RM, three RM um, just because for team sports, how often are you doing anything anywhere remotely close to your max? Like it just doesn't happen. It's a waste to train there. So for a lot of his athletes, they do, I think, two or three sessions a week, and you do one set of 20. And you, you get to the point where the weight, like when you get to 20-ish, like the weight is appropriate to, to where you're, you're just about to fatigue. And then as you get good at that, Later on, I think they drop it down to, you know, one by 12, one by 10, something like that. But um, I know a lot of, of sport performance coaches who have adopted that model just because it's like it's even if it's not uh, a sports specific movement, there's at least a little more carryover to the way that the muscles will be taxed with regards yeah. to. Athletic movements require strength, they require power, they require, you know, muscle contraction styles, um, and it's probably a little closer to, you know, your 20 RM for athletic movements versus your 1 RM, so yeah. um, I think that's pretty interesting, but anyway, yeah. um, man, we, I think we've covered a lot here, and it's very, yeah. oh man, it, it kind of feels like the rug has just been ripped out underneath me a little, but at the same time, I'm like, I kind of already knew that a little, or at least part of me thought like, even, even knowing all this, I don't actually use that every day. Like it's not, it's not changing how I coach. It's not changing how I program. Um, yeah. But it's still, I think it's really important for people to know it just because, um, you know, like if, if our whole goal as, as an industry or as, um, as a group of scientists, let's say, is to um, maintain what's good that previous generations found. Like knowledge that they found, we want to maintain what's useful and then we want to get rid of what's not useful or not true and then we want to progress it, we want to add to that. The biggest, you know, a big part of that is getting rid of, of what doesn't work. Um, and, you know, we can't know everything today. It takes time to, to learn these things. And so, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's not easy to say, oh, I was wrong about this. I thought I knew it. So that's got to be tough. And that's got to be something that people are willing to do when new evidence comes out and shows, Hey, um, maybe it's not exactly the way we thought it was. I think it's really important for us all to be able to, you know, check the ego a little bit and say, okay, all right. How does this 
how does this change, you know, what I think and does it, you know, does it take away everything that I knew or is it just, I need to, you know, adjust my focus a little bit or I need to make, you know, these small changes here and there. But, um, if our goal is to help people, whether it's health or aesthetics or athletic performance, like we've got to be willing to, uh, to not assume we know everything right now. So some, somebody's going to come along and change everybody's mind. So (laughs) that's how it goes. So awesome. Well, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, um, some of the stuff that you're currently studying or working on right now? Yeah. So, uh, I've been stuck in my house for, for, for some time. Uh, but, uh, you know, the group is still working and writing and, um, we'll have some stuff coming out on more kind of delving into some of these definitions of periodization pretty soon. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually a paper we're pretty excited about because we explore, you know, in the literature, periodization exists as sometimes stress management and sometimes as um, programming, right? Mm-hmm. And about 20% of the definitions would fall under programming, whereas maybe the other 70 or 80% would fall under like stress management. So we would kind of discuss some of that. Um, you know, I'm excited to get back in school once things are back to normal. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to do a, some blood flow restriction research. Um, we're going to try to grow some calf muscles in the fall. Nice. Um, once we figure out how to work through this whole, you know, social distancing, it's going to continue to be a little bit different. So we're going to have to, adjust how we collect data mm-hmm. um and uh yeah we're gonna just keep making muscles grow and and better understand some of these things we got some stuff coming out on changes in muscle size and changes in strength um which should be out there pretty soon um and and yeah this we're gonna keep asking questions mm-hmm. and and continue i think to to attempt to better understand a lot of these things. And I really like, and I, I enjoy the whole periodization general adaptation syndrome, um, kind of area. It's fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're working on one paper on what is adaptation energy right now? Um, which is the general adaptation syndrome gave us this whole idea of adaptation energy. And we're kind of working on some stuff with that right now as well um so yeah we're Very plenty cool. busy and yeah and keep an eye out awesome that's cool um so for everyone interested how can we follow your work how can we uh how can someone reach out to you if they have a question yeah um so i'm i'm on i, I guess all the major social medias i i'm not i'm not super active i uh um but if, if you shoot me a message or email i i will respond um hopefully in a, in a timely fashion um i think it's just at samuel buckner on instagram um and then you type in my name i'm on facebook but i, I don't use that a whole lot honestly mm-hmm. um if you want to get access to one of my papers um something of that nature you can always just shoot me an email it's s l buckner b u c k n e r at usf.edu um and yes yeah, sometimes it's just wanting access to these 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 papers and studies which um you know broaden your horizon or hard to get a hold of mm-hmm. and then twitter i am not super active on twitter either but you can um send me a message on there or i do post some research related stuff occasionally mm-hmm. and I, I think that's at samuel buckner so um yeah any one of those awesome well i'll include those in the in the show description Um, so people can, can get those. Um, so to close it out, um, I let everybody kind of have the reins to, to drop some knowledge, um, or share some advice or, um, uh, share a quote, anything like that. Something that you think everybody needs to hear. Whew. Yeah. uh... (laughs) Believe it or not, this tends to be the hardest part for uh for most guests they like prep for everything except for 
except for that one. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick it uh, stick to my area here and not try to get philosophical or uh, <laughs> outside of anything that I'm remotely knowledgeable on. Um, maybe just like summarize it, what I think would be a good takeaway. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when when one of our first periodization papers came out and then, you know, we, we wrote a series of papers on general adaptation syndrome and we got like letters to the editor written in response. And I, I remember seeing tweets that hashtag periodization isn't dead, um, that sort of thing. Um, and, and, you know, this is, this is the message I, I kind of leave with my students as well. You know, I, I like questioning things when the data doesn't line up, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so if we remove the general adaptation syndrome as a theoretical framework for periodization, periodization is not dead. You know, it mm-hmm. doesn't have that theoretical framework anymore. And, you know, I always, I, I, I tell my students that if periodization works for you, use it because it's probably as good as any other technique out there. Um, if, if something else is working better or you prefer something else, use that. Mm-hmm. Um, what I think is most important for any strength coach or, um, trainer, whatever area you work in is, you know, you have to decide what you value, right? So if you're working with a strength athlete, how much stock do you put in hypertrophy for strength, right? Um, develop your own philosophy and based on the evidence but some of these we don't have answers for yet so mm-hmm. how important is growth for strength i'm not sure i always challenge my students to decide how important that is to you how mm-hmm. important is strength for sports performance we don't have great data right it's playing some role but we don't know how important maximizing strength is for sports performance mm-hmm. so some of these things you have to take the freedom and decide okay it's going to take this much priority in my programming how important is injury prevention you know, in strength and conditioning, you know, there's good data on that. So, you know, when you develop your own philosophy, I think use periodization as you see fit. Um, stress should be managed. Um, but there's so many question marks. And, and that's where I think you have to synthesize things you the best you can and prioritize, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so, I never tell people don't train for muscle growth because a lot of the data seems to suggest it doesn't have a large influence on strength. As an insurance policy, I always want some hypertrophy, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, just don't be rigid in what you subscribe to, you know, be a consumer of knowledge and periodization is not dead. Periodization may not be what you thought it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not you specifically, you know, your, your audience. Yeah. Um, it's just stress management and Mm. you can employ what most people would say is non-fancy programming. And I think it can be just as effective as someone else's fancy programming. If it has intelligent intentions and sticks to what we know about how we adapt to different stimuli. So Mm. yeah, that was a little here, here and here all over the place. (laughs) but Hopefully encompasses my overall message, which is, you know, a lot we don't know, but there's a lot we do know. And, um, you know, just try to have intelligent approaches and and some flexibility in what you believe. For sure. Yeah, I think just just reading, uh, reading this research paper uh, forced me to to evaluate s- some of the, the things that I assumed were scientific fact and consensus that may not actually be fact or consensus. Um, and yeah, just being, being willing to look at that, um, I think makes everybody, uh, a better coach or a better kinesiologist or a better physical therapist or a better, whatever, like, uh, the more information we know, the, the better we can do our jobs. So, um, yeah, I think, I think, you brought it back around. You landed that plane. You hit the nail on the head, man. <laughs> awesome. So, Dr. Buckner, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Um, I've learned a lot. 
just reading this paper. So, um, but you know, thanks for coming on and having this conversation with me. It's been, uh, very educational and, uh, and even entertaining. So that's always a plus. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh, I'm sure we'll have you on again in the future and talk more about this and, uh, yeah, a little bit more about ways to get stronger, ways to get bigger, because that's, that's an important topic too. So oh, definitely. Awesome. Definitely. Thank you for having me on. And uh, I hope your audience enjoys the discussion. For sure. I know they will. Alrighty. All thank you so much for watching and listening and tune in next week for our next episode. Adios.